Well, hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and warm greetings to everyone. We want to welcome you to the SWOG Special Symposium. Oncology Advanced Practice Providers Can Enhance Clinical Research. We really appreciate you attending both in person and virtually, so welcome to all. My name is Jamie Myers and I chair the SWOG Nursing Research Subcommittee. And I want to go ahead and advance to the next slide. I wanna say a special thanks to the Palliative and End of Life Care Committee who co-sponsor this symposium with us. And they're represented today by Dr. Marie Bakaitis, who I saw come into the room. We didn't see where she sat. There she is. There's Dr. Bakaitis. Thank you so much to their committee. And I wanna also say a big thank you to our illustrious planning committee, which put together such an amazing array of speakers that spans multiple disciplines. We'll have to go ahead and advance to the next slide. Uh, also, the NCI Division of Cancer Prevention and Cancer Control and Population Science, multiple research bases, and most particularly, though, we want to say a special thank you to the Hope Foundation, because they're the ones without whose generous funding we would not be able to host this symposium. And I'm really excited to say that they've also sponsored for us a multi-year initiative to support and extend the contribution of um, advanced practice providers to conducting research within NCOR and uh, NCTN trials. So let's go ahead and advance to the next slide. Uh, just a couple of logistical housekeeping announcements. For those of you who are attending virtually, during the didactic portion of the session, we're gonna ask that you go ahead and stay on mute. And just so we don't have interference with bandwidth and um, video uh, speed, we'll ask that you keep your cameras off for that portion. And I just wanna point out that we will be having a panel discussion towards the latter part of the agenda. So those attending virtually, please start to put your questions in the chat for us so that we can capture those during the panel discussion. And for those of you who are here in person, another special favor to you, please step to the microphones when you wanna make a question or a comment so that those attending virtually can hear what you have to say. And so now it's my great pleasure to turn the podium over to Dr. Krista Braun Inglis. She's the primary force behind this advanced practice provider initiative. She has passionately led the efforts to develop this symposium and the future aspects of this initiative and she has assembled a simply stellar panel of speakers for you today. And I really think we're in for a treat as we get to hear them share their best practices. So Krista, take it away. Thank you, Jamie, for that kind introduction. And thank you to the Hope Foundation and the Palliative and End of Life Care Committee for your support. Um, next slide, please. Just to quickly go over the meeting agenda. So introduction, we're going, this is part of the quick introduction. Then we're gonna go into a background of the project, followed by a recap of the recent changes to NCI policy and guidelines. Then we're gonna move on to um, MD and APP collaboration to enhance accrual conduct leadership in NCI sponsored trials. And then we're gonna move on to key roles for APPs within NCI sponsored CTEP trials and DCP, DCCPS sponsored trials. And then we'll, we're gonna move on for, to our pharmacist perspective, and then we'll wrap up with a panel discussion. So just to give you a background on how we'll move through things through today. Next slide. So I'm gonna go through the background on the project. Next slide, please. So I think we all know that oncology advanced practice providers contribute significantly to the cancer care um, today. And we've really grown over the past 10 to 15 years. Actually, the amount of advanced practice providers has exploded within oncology care. Back in 2017, ASCO reported that 80% 
of survey practices employed advanced practice providers, I would say now it's probably over 95%. So we really are everywhere. We're doing so much of the clinical care. So thinking about that in terms of clinical research, I was always wondering like why I seem to be the only NP here at SWOG. And um, so I started to think about when I joined the University of Cancer, uh, University of Hawaii Cancer Center about four years ago, I wanted to get our community, our NCORE, the APPs and our NCORE more integrated into the clinical research realm. So I looked to the literature to see what, if there were other models out there or data that reflected what the advanced practice providers contribution was in clinical research and I couldn't find anything. So next slide, please. Um, we worked on developing a survey to get that benchmarking data, and I worked with um, ACCC and Harborside to develop a national survey to look at attitudes, beliefs, and roles of oncology advanced practice providers in clinical research. We distributed the survey in early 2020. Next slide, please. And we had a wide representation throughout the country. We had over 408 respondents. Next slide, please. Next slide. Oh, and what we, and the majority of respondents were nurse practitioners, although we had about 10% of respondents that were physician's assistants and about 8% pharmacists. 65% um, of the respondents came from the community and 35% came from the academic setting. Um, looking to the gender and ethnic breakdown, we tend to be a, a white females in our profession. So we are working on diversifying our profession as well, but that these are the demographics from the survey. Next slide, please. Um, what we did find that at the majority of practices, clinical trials are available and that oncology APPs believe clinical trials are important to improve the standard of cancer care and that clinical research should be a role for the advanced practice provider. And that, and that oncology advanced practice providers want to be more involved in clinical research. And that we felt comfortable talking about clinical trials to our patients. But when we dove down further, what we found that we didn't routinely talk to, try, talk to patients about trials that were available at our practice or that were appropriate for our patients. Next slide. When we, when we looked at the role of the investigator, um, we found that only 34% were rostered as a non-physician investigator with the NCI, but there were a higher percent actually reported that they were sub-investigators. So we think there was some discrepancy between NCI-sponsored trials and industry trials. And then when we looked at whether or not we actually enrolled our own patients onto trials, that was even less, and even less in leadership roles like primary investigators. Next slide. So looking at academic versus community model, we found very similar outcomes that the majority did have NCI sponsored trials available. Actually at the academic settings, over 90% had NCI sponsored trials available. But again, only 37% were rostered, rostered as non-physician investigators and only 25% had only any, any um, role within the research base and then lesser in the community. Next slide, please. So we really looked at this as an opportunity to further integrate uh, APPs within NCI-sponsored research. And we were so fortunate to get the Hope Foundation funding um, to have this multi-year initiative in SWOG and starting with this symposium. So thank you. And I'm gonna turn it over to Mark Good from the NCI to review the recent policy changes and guidelines over the past few years that actually fit perfectly with this initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Krista and Jamie and everyone to make this happen. Um, I'm a nurse by background, um, not qualified necessarily to be a, a advanced practice, but I'm so um, in, in enthused by this and just encouraged by the work that's being done here. So thank you all for um, participating in this. I also wanted to uh, call out, um, I've worked really, most of what the NCI has done has been as a result of nurse colleagues within NCI. There we have, there's a, a large contingency of us and I think many of them are very supportive of this effort as well. Next slide. 
So as many of you might be aware, in um, not that long ago, the and, and NCI CTEP uh, investigator handbook stated that uh, for writing orders for study agents had to be done by a uh, rostered or registered physician investigator. If a, not, um, a, a licensed prescriber wrote the orders, then um, the registered physician still had to sign those orders off. Um, however, on September 7th of last year, um, the NCI CTEP had modified those uh, that policy to now state that non-physician investigators are now able to write orders for study agents, including IND agents for NCI studies. Um, they have to be qualified, however, and I'll go through explaining what that means as we go forward. Um, so next slide, please. So to be qualified, um, they need to be, we, and we use the definition for the Advanced Practice Society for Hematology and Oncology, which defines them as nurse practitioners, physician assistants, nurse, clinical nurse specialists, advanced degree nurses, and pharmacists who are licensed and qualified per institutional policy, local and state laws and regulations, including requirements as mandated for international sites. So our NCI trials co are covered under this policy, include those that are within our NCOR, as well as ETCTN, NCTN, and other DCT and CTEP sponsored networks. Next slide. Part of this responsibility goes with this is the sites must also have an institutional policy that defines their qualified advanced practice providers, which includes what their credentialing process is for these individuals so that they can write orders and be consistent with their own local state laws and uh, mandates. Um, they also need to have a statement that um, this, this, these people are, um, that, that the investigator, physician investigator there, there is one that is responsible for all the trial related medical decisions, as well as has oversight for the advanced practice providers. Um, and they should have this policy stored in their site's regulatory binder or somewhere so and be accessible uh, should uh, an audit or uh, people want to see it. Um, the sites then need to ensure that these advanced practice providers are rostered within the RCR system as non-physician investigators. And that requires the non-physician investigators would need to uh, do complete similar steps as physician investigators, meaning a 1572 financial disclosure, submit their bio sketch as well as evidence of uh, GCP training. Um, and that needs to be done uh, renewed on an annual basis. Um, then the sites, uh, clinical investigators or CIs also then should identify who those APPs are for writing study agents on DT on the DTL if there's one associated with the study. And the, those APPs would then be assigned the task of IND prescribing. And then the I, uh, CI needs to sign that document off. Next slide, please. So these, these policy is posted on the web, CTEP's website under the investigator handbook. And uh, I'll, I think the slides are gonna be provided so that they can have access to this link later. Next slide, please. So NCI, DCP, DCCPS, or Division of Cancer Con Prevention and Division of Cancer Control and Population Science um, developed a guideline in October of 20, um, a little, about a year prior to the release of the CTEP update. Um, and we also follow the same definition as um, the um, organization for defining who were a, uh, APPs. And just also just to briefly, NCOR trials for those who are not aware are associated with cancer control, symptom management, uh, screening, early detection, as well as cancer care delivery studies. So for those studies, we feel uh, that advanced practice providers are qualified to serve as co uh, serve as chairs within a PhD level only, but the others can serve as co-chairs. And they can also serve as local investigators to consent and enroll patients to our NCOR trials. Um, and we also then uh, um, follow the CTEP policy. We updated our guidelines to match CTEP's policy as far as writing orders as well, including the requirement to be an NPIBR and renew that annually and um, be on the DTL if there is one. Next slide. And we post our uh, guidelines on the NCOR portal, which right now is a password protected website for NCOR grantees. Um, I'm happy to send those out. I think we could send them out somehow maybe to the people that are attending today, but I'm also working on a process to see if we can get this, those posted to a more public available website for those non-NCOR participating sites. Um, and, and we'll get that done. 
Next slide, please. So just to give a little bit of information about changes over time. So this is um, looking at um, October 4th of 2021, which is about a month after the CTEP policy was released and five months later in early March. And the change is looking at sites that have approved NPIVRs for detail uh, for IND prescribing on a DTL and protocols that have IND prescribing tasks and looking at individuals that have been approved for this prescribing task and how they've changed over time. So if you look at the number of sites that have approved NPIVRs, it's increased like by almost 30% in that just five months time period. Um, and looking at individual changes, that's some um, individual NPIVRs approved for IND prescribing task has increased um, almost 45% during those five months. So we're very encouraged by this. I think there's, there's uptake, we're seeing a change and we are enhancing, which is our goal. Next slide. By looking at protocol by sponsor, um, NCTN, all, you can look at the time, the differences between the time periods again, and there's a steady increase across all. There's, you can look at the NCTN and, and each of the research bases is broken down. Um, NCORE, we don't have many uh, IND studies just by the nature of our trials. However, we now do have two. Um, and, and, and also you can see the comparison between ETT, CTN and other network groups, um, network programs. Next slide. So as far as looking at site approvals, there's also been an increase when you look at NCTN protocols and then the, that's broken down by um, LAP grantees, NCORE grantees and rostered sites. Um, again, when you look at the um, LAPS and grant, NCORE grantees, there's been about 30% increase and about a 20% increase when looking at rostered sites. And again, these are sites that have approved NPIVRs on, as an IND prescribing task on a DTL. And there's then increases also in the, the other two categories. Next slide. When looking at enrollment, again, as I said earlier, for, N for NCORE studies, um, this was initiated in October of 2020, we allow um, NPIVRs to consent and enroll patients. And, and this slide looks at fiscal years, which is what our NCORE grant uh, period runs from August to July. Prior to the release, we didn't have any NPIVRs, which is probably appropriate because it wasn't allowed at that time. Um, enrolling patients to trials. But then if you look at the next year, within that year is when we released our guidelines, um, had almost 475 within that just that first year um, that enrolled patients and we're thrilled by that. We're in our current year of August um, 21 and this data is as of seven months into the year and end of February with when I was pulled uh, the data. Um, if you look at just the straight numbers for seven months, if you wonder, so I, I didn't annualize the data by dividing the number by seven for enrollments per month times 12 and, and came up with maybe an estimation or an annualized number. And, and when you do that, when you look at the total accrual, it's like a 60% increase. Yes. So um, really, really thank the, all the NPIVRs out there that are making this happen. And we hope that this is encouraging others to do the same. Um, so next slide. So um, we're going to, um, Kate and I and Andrea are going to be on the panel for NCI representation. So we'll be happy to answer any questions at the end of this discussion, but we also providing um, contacts here if you have other questions or concerns or things that we need to look at. We're happy to hear from you. So thank you. Thanks so much, Raj, for that wonderful update. It's so exciting to see more um, APPs getting involved. So this is thanks to the NCI too for updating their guidelines and their policy. So next slide, please. So now we're gonna um, feature some uh, MD-APP collaborations to enhance accrual conduct and leadership within NCI-sponsored trials. I'd like to first ask up to the podium, Dr. Al Benson, he is a professor of medicine and the associate director for cooperative groups at Northwestern. He's also the vice chair of ECOG Akron. He's also been a huge supporter of this project ongoing. He was involved in our survey development and dissemination and publication. So I really appreciate him being here for this. And his um, 
key APP, Bridget O'Brien, who's going to be presenting virtually, and she is faculty, uh, nurse practitioner faculty at Rush University, but worked for many years with Dr. Benson at Northwestern. So please uh, welcome Dr. Al Benson and Dr. Bridget O'Brien. Thank you. And next slide, please. Good morning. Is Bridget on? Bridget is on. Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I think Bridget's beginning. Okay, next slide, please. Thank you. Sorry I couldn't be with you in person, but I am happy, happy to join you. So we wanted to talk a little bit about our practice and how we really integrated clinical research as kind of a model into the work we did every day. So Dr. Benson and I worked together for over 20 years and we were actually developing the first nurse practitioner MD model in the cancer center. So I was the first nurse practitioner in, in really all of the cancer center. And we so we got to kind of have the fun of um, developing it from scratch. We, we know, and what, one of the key points uh, that we think about in terms of this collaboration and really integrating nurse practitioners or, or, or uh, APPs in general into oncology research is really having that um, education right up front. So it has to be differentiated based on the clinical experience. So for our example, you know, I had come into uh, the practice with many, many years of, of oncology experience. However, I worked primarily in bone marrow transplant and now I was working in GI. So there was learning needs in that area. Uh, but as you are bringing APPs into your practices, it's really important to, you know, tailor that education. And we'll talk more about kind of educational opportunities in the future. Um, it, it, all the initial training had a focus on clinical trials as a standard of care. So um, Dr. Benson, I think, is one of the greatest advocates, advocates for this in general, that this is the standard of care for all patients, and we really need to think of offering clinical trials to every single patient who might be a candidate for that. And so that education of our APPs um, who came after me and, you know, really should be done across the board is that, you know, we need to be thinking about clinical trial engagement for all of our patients. Uh, we had exposure to many different opportunities for clinical trials, including ECOG Akron, the industry-sponsored trials, and our own Northwestern House trials. Um, every patient we evaluated as a potential trial candidate, from patients coming in with a new diagnosis to any change in treatment, along with patients that we could have potentially a symptom management trial. Our intention was to develop an independent practice uh, where I would have my own schedule and we would, you know, once we got to the point where everybody was comfortable with everybody's uh, learning needs, that we would always work in collaboration, of course. But, you know, if this was integrated into our practice that uh, we were looking at clinical trials for, for really all patients, you know, it didn't matter whether you saw myself or whether you saw Dr. Benson, um, that we really wanted to make sure that everybody was considered no matter who you saw. And we knew that there was um, opportunities that this role, you know, um, allowed that in order to have everybody, the whole team, you know, working on really the same goals, then, you know, if we had to have prof professional development opportunities, which, um, you know, Dr. Benson does a lot of, of course, um, there was clinic coverage and there was uh, really, you know, the opportunity for, um, you know, not, we're not missing a step by depending on who's out of town. Next slide, please. Uh, fostering a collaborative approach uh, really meant having a uh, clinical trial focus as a priority in all patient care, which I'll, I'm going to say over and over again because it's just that important. So it didn't matter who the provider was. And we really both had an expectation and really all of our clinical um, uh, partners have an expectation that we need to accrue to trial. So with every patient encounter, this was always kind of top of mind. We have uh, over time developed weekly clinical trials meetings, uh, which now seems sort of, you know, of course you did, but um, back then this was a new model for us. And so we wanted to work as a group and meet with the providers, the nurses and the research associates all at one time, um, where everybody sat in the room and talked about the, the, these issues as a whole. And we expanded that over time to include our whole multidisciplinary groups. So our whole um, GI team of, of uh, oncologists, providers, um, APPs, as well as the nurses. And clinical trial discussion was highlighted at our, our um, tumor boards, our multidiscipl multidisciplinary boards. And what that really allowed us to um, encourage was that now we got all the other members of our team. You know, GI, of course, is a huge multidisciplinary group. Um, so whether it was the surgeons or whether it was the interventional radiologists or even our pathologists, that everybody was talking about, is there a trial for this patient with really every review of, of uh, patients in those boards? 
what was important for us too is that um, in my uh, early days of you know being a new APP to this role and developing the role together with Dr. Benson, we really um, thought it was important for me to have involvement in, in ECOG Akron. That was the primary cooperative group that we worked with. And, um, and I will give full credit to, uh, to Dr. Benson about this, that he was really the champion. And I think you'll hear me say that and Dr. Benson say that as well, that you really needed a physician champion as well for many reasons. And so it's really important to um, make sure that, that everybody is you know, thinking about what are the opportunities. And when I became involved with ECOG Akron, I became very heavily involved with the nursing committee. And so, you know, sometimes APPs may not be coming to our meetings as much because maybe there isn't a, a space where they feel like they belong. Um, but, you know, it wasn't just a nursing committee. So if, if the, you know, APPs weren't getting, you know, exactly what they wanted out of that, um, we were really involved with the disease specific committee. I became a nurse liaison to that committee and uh, really involved with the symptom management committee because, of course, as nurses uh, and nurse practitioners and APPs in general, symptom management is something that we really uh, have expertise in. Next slide, please. So it's not moving on my hand. No. Okay, there we go. Perfect. Thank you. So then we also want to focus on what did we help in terms of accrual in our own set, in our own site, um, and why was this important? Uh, we really reviewed panels of patients on a weekly basis. So, I mean, um, you know, we have this very collaborative relationship and we were talking through cases all the time, but we really went through a systematic review once a week to talk about where, you know, patients were at, did they have scan changes or something that may be making us think about treatment changes and did we want to be thinking about um, potential trials. So just having a really um, systematic approach in doing that. Uh, we would get weekly updates on the trials as part of our meetings of what was, you know, ongoing, what was going to be opening soon, what was closing soon. But we didn't have to wait for those meetings. You know, if we were in front of a patient face-to-face uh, -face and we, you know, knew that there was an opportunity for maybe thinking about a symptom management trial or thinking about a change in treatment, you know, we would have a real-time uh, investigation in the middle of our, our um, trial to, or I'm sorry, in the middle of our, middle of our encounter with the patient to go ahead and um, you know, be able to look on our clinical research office website and see what was available. This eventually led to embedding um, a research nurse into our clinic. So that was a huge change in our practice that you know, Dr. Benson and I didn't have to stop what we were doing, get on the website, look at you know, what trials might be available, that we just had a nurse kind of sitting right next to us and, and or at least within quick reach um, that you know, could go through what we were talking about in terms of any kind of change for the patient and suggesting other trials. So again, just kind of keeping this always the top of mind. We had opportunities for enrolling uh, patients, you know, whether again, whether it was just myself seeing the patient if um, Dr. Benson was out of town or whether we were seeing the patient together. So that wasn't a, a limiting factor. Uh, and we really did feel like this fostered professional relationships um, outside of our center as well. So we would maybe see a patient and we would go through, you know, oh, there isn't a trial available here. Um, but based on my connections, Dr. Benson's connections, we have local centers that do more, you know, phase one trials maybe than we do, or um, we have connections through ECOG Akron and we could provide opportunities for clinical trials, not just limited to trials at our center, but you know, again, thinking that this is the standard of care, what's best for the patient, that we would refer them out if need be. Next slide, please. Uh, the next slide, uh, Al's going to speak to you, please.
sorry to interrupt, but the virtual speakers, the virtual attendees cannot hear the speaker. Okay. I'd like the mic to get turned off. I don't want to make everyone be able to see that screen, but it should be coming through. Yeah. Make sure. Uh, of course, of their uh, clinical trial enrollment. Um, Oh, okay. Is that okay? Uh, in addition, um, we, we still need to work in defining the, the role of the APP in the cooperative groups. And I think that's part of the purpose of this meeting today. And it's certainly of great interest within uh, ECOG uh, uh, Akron. Uh, also, uh, the cooperative groups, as you've just heard, provides a great vehicle for research uh, including uh, nurses in training, where there may be opportunities for their work to be uh, integrated in the cooperative groups. And uh, we know that many universities have the DMP programs, and so this should be uh, explored. But also, uh, just like in oncology fellowships, we are trained uh, in clinical trials research. I think that's going to be critical for these DMP programs, uh, particularly those going into uh, oncology. Uh, next slide, Bridget. So we're, we keep asking, what can we do to increase the involvement of APPs and cooperative groups? We know there's a, an opportunity for clinical research training. And so, uh, like Al said, we've, that's something that we're looking at both on a formal and informal process, but it's a great um, outcome that we hope to participate um, as with things like this to really figure out what's the right model for us to move forward with that. There needs to be education of kind of all players, the physicians, the APPs, practice leadership about the importance and the need for involvement of clinical research. So like Krista said, you know, she's the only APP that's in SWAG. I'm often the only APP at the um, nursing committee in, in ECOG Akron. And so we have to prioritize it both locally and nationally in order to change that. Uh, which means that cancer centers really need to provide academic support time. I think we're all pressured in our clinical arenas to, you know, see as many patients and, and you know, have billing and all these things. But this academic work is really part of our, our practices and really essential to our practice and our, our um, great care of patients. And so we need to explain to the um, cancer centers the importance. 
Uh, primary investigators and centers must engage APPs in the cooperative groups and champion their support using, you know, what Al did as a model. Um, cooperative groups should uh, create committees potentially, or even task force. I mean, each cooperative group can kind of look at what's best for them of whether they would be part of a nursing committee, part of the disease committee, or have their own standing committee. Because uh, really APPs are essential providers for uh, the symptom control trials and the ability to increase accrual. It was fun to see uh, Marge's slides and see how those numbers have increased. And I think that's really gonna have an impact on accrual as well. Uh, and then we need to have, you know, APPs really involved at the early end. We learned with our um, nursing committee in ECOG Akron that having nurses involved with clinical trial development really at the very start sort of changed, you know, some of the conversations that went on and whether uh, people were able to enroll trials at their sites. Uh, and so doing that with APPs as well and using their specialty knowledge uh, will be really helpful moving forward. Next slide, please. And then the broader focus specifically that we had with uh, ECOG Akron is that, you know, we really focused on having a, a, an accrual task force come out of the nursing committee and having the APPs be involved in that uh, will be even uh, more uh, rich and, and robust. Uh, started we, we started with highlighting high priority trials for accrual. We have a protocol uh, development liaison that would report to the committee at each meeting uh, with accrual concerns and really focus on high priority trials. We would invite our PI to speak at committees, um, at committee meetings to review protocols. We'd have education uh, specific to the low accruing trials. And we'd review all protocols and development for accrual and feasibility concerns. So we actually, out of this, uh, separate accrual task force, we'd have um, nurses that would be looking at the disease trials, but then we'd have somebody that's looking really at all the trials um, specifically for that lens of accrual and feasibility. And I think, again, the APPs would be a great addition to that. Uh, and then education uh, for the nursing committee to advocate for trials opening at their sites. So we've learned that, you know, by highlighting these like low accruing trials or trials that may have more um, complexity, that at our meetings and we, when we highlight them, that then the nurses can go back and, and advocate and uh, like expect that maybe some trials can open that maybe weren't open before our meetings. So again, since the APPs are seeing so many of our patients now, uh, we really need their engagement as well. Next slide, please. As we're a little shorter on time now, um, I'm gonna turn this over to Al and talk about this just last topic briefly. Uh, yes, thanks Bridget. So. Um, Krista mentioned uh, ACCC, and ACCC is really a unique organization because the membership um, includes all practitioners within the uh, oncology uh, venue. And um, for example, the presidents of ACCC have not only been medical oncologists, uh, they've been, there have been nurses. Uh, our most recent president was a social worker. And uh, I think uh, this is a great vehicle uh, for APPs to become involved and uh, to have uh, an increasing role. Uh, these last two years, there's been huge emphasis within ACCC in terms of clinical research uh, including addressing the issues of disparities and equity. And I, I think APPs will have a, a huge role in this arena also. So I'm not going through uh, all of these uh, specific areas within ACCC, but I think this is another vehicle where we can uh, expand uh, the role of APPs uh, nationally and within professional organizations. So I, I, I really appreciate having this opportunity to join you today and particularly uh, thank Kristen and Jamie for all their efforts. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Benson and uh, Bridget for the great uh, presentation. I'm now gonna welcome up my uh, collaborating uh, physician to talk about how we do it in uh, the community because we're from the University of Hawaii Cancer Center and part of the Hawaii Minority Underserved NCOR. So please welcome Dr. Jamie Fukui. Thanks, Krista. And thanks so much for this very important um, symposium. Uh, next slide, please. Um, here's a picture actually of the University of Hawaii Cancer Center, which is uh, beautifully <laughs> situated right in front of the water. So there's a lot of um, 
you know, wonderful things when we're writing grants and things. Um, it's actually housed <laughs> right where the medical school is. Um, there is a residency program, but there is no hematology oncology fellowship program. So we are completely community facing. Um, we don't have a university hospital. So all of our uh, clinics and um, community hospitals are through the Hawaii Cancer Consortium. Next slide. So this is kind of our, our overall workflow, and we're going to go through each of these very briefly, kind of back and forth. And if you look, the acronym is actually ACRUEL. So ACRUEL, is uh, Chris is going to talk a little bit about how that's really how we get people engaged in the whole process of clinical trials, and then the actual conduct, how we do this in our practice. Finally, how we review protocols and then leadership opportunities. Next slide, Pete, please. So... We have a workflow where um, I will work with the coordinator every week for just about 10 to 15 minutes to review our schedules for the upcoming week, look at new consults, patients, all of that, and then say, okay, this looks like this patient's eligible for this trial, or this patient might be eligible for this trial. And then we'll uh, message that to Dr. Pukui, and then she'll follow up and introduce the potential trial at the consult. And then I'll take it from there and I'll follow up at the treatment counseling because that's just our general workflow for patients on trial or not on trial. Um, and that just seems to work really well. And we, you know, we incorporate our coordinator at all levels as well, because they're kind of our, another key person on our team. Um, we don't have research nurses, so we are working with coordinators, which are super awesome, but it does have it help to have the APP in the middle for clinical content and things like that to really help the coordinators along. Um, when we think about our existing patients, much like uh, uh, Al and Bridget talked about, we've created a, a culture of clinical trials within our practice. So we're always thinking about clinical trials and we're always um, talking to our patients about trials. One thing that Dr. Fukui taught me is we actually keep it as a problem list in our, pro one of our problems in our progress notes, you know? So we actually always say at the end, clinical trials and what potentially, what, what are they enrolled in? What's a potential trial for them and what we're looking at. So I think that really helps and then that keeps it going in our thoughts and discussing it with our patients. I'm going to turn it over to Jamie for conduct. Next slide, please. So this is how we kind of run our clinic, not to belabor the point, but these are shared but independent visits. So we have uh, this, the same patient panel, um, and this is for clinical trial visits. There are no different workflow for someone who's on trial or not on trial, but we hope that everybody is on a trial. We work very collaboratively, and so the protocol obviously is how we guide overall um, our, our, our study visit. And um, we've already heard already how the CTEP policy has changed where APPs can independently sign for treatment orders, which is much smoother to our workflow, but also with our CRAs. And often, as you know, with the workforce that has been overturning, there's a lot of newer CRAs. And so the APP really serves as a resource for these new clinical research coordinators, as well as CRAs for the trial. Next slide, please. So um, are you gonna do this one? Okay, I'm gonna do it. <laughs> okay, sorry, we're going back and forth. So, um, so Jamie typically really takes the lead on all the treatment trials that are specific for our practice, and she reviews them for scientific merit and feasibility. But we really do talk about you know the true feasibility piece and whether they're appropriate for our patients together. But um, she, I really take the lead in our practice on the cancer control, supportive care, and CCDR protocols, and so I'll so not only myself, but other APPs in our community actually review these trials too for scientific merit and feasibility and the appropriateness of our patient population. And really specifically for the implementation trials, we use our APPs a lot to figure out how to implement these different cancer care delivery um, mechanisms into the clinic space. So that's worked really well for us as well. Uh, the next slide is actually pretty much a review of that and, and how we situate kind of our leadership. So um, pretty much for the PI is serving for the treatment trials. It's, it's mainly an MD, but that can certainly change. Um, and for more of the cancer control symptom management, CCDR, that is something that's more driven by the APP. And that's kind of how our practice is. You know, Chris is hearing a lot more about some of the side effects when we start treatment. That's more of, um, you know, the, the, or the next steps is usually something that I usually have a, a discussion with. Um, next slide. This is, this is some examples, actually. So some great examples that we have uh, accrued to. So 
for the 1418, this was a, more of a treatment trial for um, triple negative breast cancer. So I was enrolling PI and the site champion for this. Um, and with the SWOG 1714, this was more of a peripheral neuropathy trial where um, Krista was the site PI. And so this kind of focuses that we're really enhancing kind of our strengths, but also um, how it's so important that we um, are, are, are doing both of these in our practice. Okay, next slide. I'm just, you know, closing up, we want to really emphasize how important it is to work as a team and really value what each discipline brings um, to the team. You know, as we work together in our practice, we also find our coordinator very key as well as our other, you know, we definitely bring in other disciplines too for different information and different input, especially in the CCDR trials, <laughs> you know, quite honestly, because they're so important to implement into the into the clinic workflow. Um, but we really value the teams, the team's approach. And finally, um, next slide, please. So we really have worked hard within our NCOR um, to register APPs um, with within RCR as non-physician investigators. They do really, they do perform functions of sub-investigators, enrolling investigators, site PIs, they review um, cancer control. So it's not only me, uh, you know, there's a group of us in our community that's really come together and really um, has taken the lead on a lot of these things that are really important members of our community. And they do vote too at our community research advisory board on all trials, whether or not they're appropriate for our community. So thank you. And I'm gonna now turn it over to Lisa kutch -Scotty. Next slide, please. Oh, this is my mahalo slide. <laughs> and I wanna thank everybody who's here from Hawaii and all your support uh, to this for this initiative. Next slide, please. And we're gonna, Lisa's gonna talk about key roles for APPs within the NCI sponsored trials and specifically within CTEP. Next slide. And before Lisa starts, I just want to introduce her properly. She is a nurse practitioner at Mayo Clinic, and she is the chair of the Alliance Nursing Committee, and she's an associate professor of oncology at Mayo Clinic, and she's really, I saw her speak about 15 years ago in an NCTTG meeting, and I was just blown away at what she was doing, and I was like, I want to be like her when I grow up, even though I'm older than her, I think. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> Wow, thank you for the warm welcome. Okay. Um, I won't show you a slide of what my site looks like because I left snow yesterday. <laughs> so we'll just leave the nice picture of Hawaii in everybody's <laughs> brain. Um, thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Um, I've been working with Krista for probably the last year and a half and stuff on APPs and clinical trials and how do we get more involved. And I'm just, I'm so proud of her for this um, symposium and what she's been able to put together. And I think we're gonna do some good work here. All right, next slide, please. So where can APPs be involved in clinical trials? They can be involved from the beginning. There's all kinds of things up front that APPs can help with clinical trials. They can do concept reviews. Um, within Alliance, a lot of our APPs do protocol development and reviews. So there's certain parts of the protocol that they help to, to write. At your local level, they can be on IRBs. Um, they can be on institutional scientific reviews committees. I happen to sit on um, our uh, Institutional Scientific Review Committee at Mayo, and they can also be co-PIs and PIs on clinical trials. Next slide. So during that protocol kind of implementation and execution process, education of staff, they can talk to the research RNs, they can even educate different MDs within their own tumor groups about what trials are available. Also looking to make sure that you have adequate resources for your protocol. Um, I love my PI for the melanoma protocol, but sometimes he sends me protocols and I'm like, yeah, that's not gonna happen, sorry. <laughs> um, we need to kind of figure this out a little better. It, it looks great on paper, but think about this in clinic and how this is actually gonna go. Um, they can be members of data safety monitoring boards and they can also participate in clinical trial audits. Next slide, please. Identifying patients, I think as Krista and others have alluded to, um, this is a great opportunity for APPs to find patients for clinical trials. At my particular institution, our APPs in oncology do all the new registration reviews. And what I mean by that is 
People who are requesting opinions at um, Mayo Clinic for Oncology, we take direct referrals in our department, unlike some other departments, but we actually review all of those patients. Um, we write their orders, you know, things they need pre-testing before they come. But the one thing that we all do is we look to see if there's any clinical trials they might be eligible for. And then we alert our study coordinators that this patient's coming, you know, go ahead and look through their outside records and see if they might be eligible for a particular trial. Within our clinics on a day-to-day -day basis, we do what's called running the list. Um, we too do not have RN study coordinators for most of our groups. We're working on that, but mm -hmm. as everybody knows, I think RNs in general are very short in supply today. Um, but we have wonderful CRAs who come to clinic every day. They have a list of our patients. They will look at all their scans and say, hey, your patient's progressed. I think they might be eligible for this trial. We kind of talk through it together. And that just kind of helps give us a reminder on a daily basis of who might be eligible for trials. And then also within our practice, I also review the internal referrals too for new patients. So that's another opportunity. Next slide, please. Again, has been kind of mentioned before, consent and enrollment. Um, it's wonderful the changes that have been made at NCI to allow us some more flexibility to do this. You know, we can confirm el eligibility, sign their checklist, get their baseline adverse events, and then obtaining consent from these patients. Next slide, please. Next slide, oh, sorry. Um, continuity of care, again, we are the ones a lot of times in clinic who are doing a lot of the continuity visits for patients, um, especially treatment patients. We can do grade and attribute their AEs, help manage their side effects. We can do tumor measurements. Um, and then we also can work now with uh, managing dose reductions and uh, dose changes on those patients on clinical trial. Next slide, please. So how do we get APPs more involved at a national level? And I know some of these things have been brought up before, but I really encourage at your sites to have your APPs become members of the cooperative groups that you guys belong to at a site. Um, attending those group meetings, being members of the disease committees. Within Alliance, probably half of our nursing committee is actually nurse practitioners. Um, there are several PhD prepared RNs, and then there are other RNs who are study coordinators, um, management, uh, and then we have a few treatment nurses who are also. So I think we have a very wide variety so that all those voices are heard, but it's really great having a lot of APPs on that committee as well. Um, one big thing I think we could work a little better on is breaking down some of those barriers of APP um, membership at national societies. And I just put a few examples up here. ASH currently still does not allow APPs to become members. And this has really bothered me for a long time. I don't do hematology, so I don't have to deal with it, but I have a lot of friends who are very jealous of the fact that I'm a member of ASCO and they can't become a member of ASH. We're working on that. There's actually a big initiative through APSHO, which is the Advanced Practitioner Society of Hematology Oncology. We're working with ASH to try and get them to understand why this would be value added for them. Um, but so far that still hasn't kind of come to fruition. SITSI, which is the Society of Immunotherapy um, Care, has recently changed their membership roles and now APPs can actually be full members with full voting privileges. Um, that was a huge um, thing for us. I actually, I got involved with the membership committee specifically for this because I wanted to see that happen. And I was very proud that they had already kind of come to that conclusion right as I was coming on the committee. ASCO is kind of in the middle. They do allow APP membership, but they still restrict some activities. We still can't sponsor our own research when we submit things for uh, the annual meeting. Not that that's a huge barrier, but it just, to me, it's still a little bothersome that I did the work, I'm submitting the thing, and I can't sponsor my own abstract. Um, one thing I didn't put on this slide that I want to bring up that Chris is a part of as well is part of APSHO, we actually just have a new committee called Research Quality Improvement. And this is actually a big task of that committee is to further engage APPs in research. So just knowing that on a national level, we hear you and we're trying to work on that. Next slide. So how do you actively um, get your APPs involved at a local level? Again, encouraging your APPs to be on the tumor boards, uh, disease-oriented committees. 
At Mayo, we have disease-oriented groups that all new concepts and clinical trials have to go through the disease group first for um, endorsement before they can move on to um, development. And our APPs do sit on our disease-oriented groups, um, embedding pharmacists in your clinical practice as well. Um, this is something new to us at Mayo. We have three tumor groups right now that have a pharmacist embedded in clinic with them best thing ever. Um, I am not privileged to have one in my tumor group, but I, I really borrow the lung one who sits in our same workroom. So <laughs> she, she does two, two for one and I, I pay her and um, food rewards and coffee for everything she does. Um, working between the academic centers and community sites. Um, you know, we have a large community representation within Mayo and trying to um, there is a um, enterprise-wide thing with APPs from other uh, research sites besides the three big males, uh, trying to get them to understand research and do things as well. And then allowing membership in their cancer center. And this, this kind of varies by the site, but um, it can allow them to be involved in more committees and have that APP voice. Next slide, please. You can just tap through this. So just one second. So this was one thing that I want to show just some successes of how APPs can be involved in research. Um, next click. You can see at the bottom, this was actually a trial that I wrote for way back in NCCTG days. And the results of that trial actually ended up becoming an NCCN guideline. <laughs> next slide, or next thing. Um, here is uh, ASCO guidelines, um, an update for uh, chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy. Next click. And this actually came out of the alliance from uh, Dr. Ellen Smith. Um, so she also is an APP by training, but is also a PhD prepared RN. So just, I just want to show that there are ways um, that APPs can contribute to research uh, within the cooperative group system. Next slide. Thank you everybody for your attention. I, again, I'm just so proud to be part of this effort with Krista and, and thanks for having me today. Thanks so much, Lisa. It's great to hear how much APP involvement there is in Alliance, and I'm sure that you've spearheaded that. So it's great to be talking more about this throughout the cooperative groups. And now I'm going to um, introduce our next pair, um, uh, Kate Castro. She, as you probably all know her, she's the NCA, NCI Program Director for Health care delivery research program. So she's like our CCDR champion. And um, in addition, we're going to have Marie Flannery, who is a associate professor at, from the University of Rochester School of Nursing and the URCC research base. Next slide, please. And they're going to talk about um, opportunities for APPs in NCORE specific research. So thank you. Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon for those of you who are virtually and are, are headed toward the East Coast. I, I too want to express my thanks to, um, first my uh, thanks to Krista and the whole team for setting this up. Uh, we at the NCI were really, really excited when we heard about this. And I, I want to um, also uh, tell you that I really agree with what Marge said. I think Marge and Andrea and I and the entire team of nurses back at NCI are incredibly supportive of this and Dr. McCaskill Stevens and Dr. Geiger and the whole team at NCOR is really supportive of APPs being involved in this work too. So just wanna really stress for you um, that we think this is incredibly important and are happy to be here today. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm gonna give uh, an overview really on the NCOR side. And I'm not sure as I was listening to uh, the earlier presentations, I'm like, yep, they set that up for me, they set that up for me, they set that up for me. But I have a first question, and for those of you in the room, and if people want, virtually want to put on chat, how many of you are APPs? How, how many of you here are APPs? Okay, and how many of you are, um, I know there's almost 100 people on the um, virtual line, how many uh, people in the room are at places where you're interested in engaging APPs in this work? Okay, so wow, a large number in the room here are definitely interested in that. So I'm gonna talk specifically about um, in NCOR, what are some of these areas? And there's just been some outstanding examples given to us here. So if you think of NCOR being prevention, cancer control, symptom science, and cancer care delivery research as the, as the key focus areas, 
you, the APP's expertise and, and the assessment skills and their experience in managing symptoms is really a key area where symptom science uh, can be a, a terrific place for you to make a difference and really be engaged in these studies. And Lisa just gave some excellent uh, examples of, of the work that APPs have done leading this work. So I think that symptom science is a terrific place to set this up. You play critical roles in the care delivery team. So understanding how uh, the care delivery system functions and, and, and where, where this work might be done. So in cancer care delivery, often we are looking at the opportunity to do practice level randomization studies. The practice is actually the unit of study and that intervention is being done at the practice side. We need the expertise of those of you who are embedded in this clinical system and this care delivery system to really say, that's not feasible. This isn't how we cadence someone through. We can't give them a decision aid at this point because this isn't how they move through our system. These things are critical for us to understand and for the research bases to understand as they, as they move through this. So really seeing the opportunities here um, as we do our work within moving into a lot of practice randomized studies, both within cancer care delivery, but also we've heard of multiple studies here at SWOG this week that are um, in the cancer control space as well, uh, randomized at the practice level. And then engaging APPs from other disciplines. And we've just heard a big shout out for the pharmacists and I'm gonna give another one. So as March talked about this morning, our policy does include pharmacists as advanced practice providers. In NCOR in cancer care delivery research, the University of Rochester research base has a CCDR study that is actually um, focused on looking at oncology drug shortages. This is an excellent opportunity to really engage your pharmacist and the pharmacy team in understanding you know, what, what are the impacts of these drug shortages and having those people be the leads for this sort of work. So lots of great opportunities we feel for APPs within NCORE work. Next slide, please. This is building on the uh, earlier uh, data that Marge showed you. Uh, the table that's on the bottom is exactly the same table you saw from Marge. And again, just reiterating, looking at the progression we have in, here in non-physician investigators and, and those numbers going up. As of last week, when Marge and I looked in the database, the NCORSIS database, there are over a thousand non-physician investigators that are listed in NCORSIS and uh, about 950 of them are fully rostered and active. So a large number um, there ready to go and um, able to engage in your research. So being thinking about um, who are these people, do I have them at my site and how can I get them going in this work? Next slide, please. So uh, we recently, uh, last fall, November, December, and then uh, also in January, we had a cancer care delivery research seminar series and um, in this seminar series, we had a, a number of panels that discussed both the research-based perspective of conducting practice randomized trials, as well as the site perspective. And looking back at the summary information from that, I think there were a lot of really great opportunities for advanced practice providers. Um, thinking about intervention delivery, again, the practice being the place where this intervention is, is taking place, and how will this work within your practice, and how do you get that buy-in from everyone in the practice? As an APP, you are a member of that team, so you are someone who will understand the nuances and the culture. Culture has been mentioned multiple times this morning. You are part of that culture and, and will understand how best to really nuance that and work with your research coordinators then to see this move forward. Also thinking about how to identify the challenges and what are the opportunities for addressing them. Sometimes challenges might seem insurmountable to us as a research nurse or as a coordinator, but you might be the person who really, again, is more embedded in that team and has an idea how to do that. Engaging these other departments in cancer care delivery, you've got other departments frequently that you're working with. You might have a prehabilitation program for frail elderly patients undergoing large uh, surgeries. And so you've got to get PT and OT engaged. We've already talked about pharmacy. We have a couple of uh, cancer care delivery studies that um, involve the electronic health record and an intervention actually on the record. And so are, do you have a relationship with IT and can you be someone who might be 
be able to work with your leadership and administration to, to move something like that forward. Again, multiple opportunities. You've heard about them already in the previous speakers here, but many places to serve um, as study champions, uh, site PIs, um, all, all of the co-investigator work, lots of opportunities for how to be engaged. Next slide, please. So where do you get started and where do you go home if you're interested in doing this and, and how do you engage your, your APPs and where would they start? Uh, it's already been said, um, you know, Alan Bridget did a perfect job of saying, engage with your research bases. They gave a terrific example of how ECOG Akron, they have engaged with ECOG Akron. Lisa, same thing with the Alliance. Engage with your research bases. I want to send the message, the research bases are really, really open to having APPs as part of the work. Uh, we have some research-based PIs uh, from NCOR that are on the um, meeting today virtually as well, and I'm sure they'll speak up as we go. Study design, understanding what are the important questions. In cancer care delivery, we would love to have questions come from those of you who are in the care delivery setting asking that question of why this occurs. Well, APPs are our primary people to do that. Um, protocol review, development, is this feasible? Is this a reasonable way to do this? Is this eligibility criteria reasonable? Are we gonna be able to consent a patient within five days of diagnosis for a not financial hardship study? Uh, the answer is probably no, because they're not concerned about financial hardship. They haven't even gotten the bill. What they're concerned about is what's affecting them in that first five days. So how do you give that feedback to, to make sure things are feasible? Also along the way, there's a lot of engagement with um, certainly in our NCORs, in our cancer care delivery, where there's study focused meetings that take place as the studies are going on, might be quarterly or a couple times a year. And this is a great way for you to give feedback that then moves forward for amendments that the study team considers. So lots of great places to engage with your research bases. And then for those of you who are here today, who are considering how do I get APPs more engaged at home? Obviously it's your culture, but thinking about as you're reviewing your studies, as they're coming from the research bases, do you have an APP who might be someone you want to review that study? How can you have them take a look at that protocol? How do you engage them along the way? And then I would say forums like this, and we hope that this work will continue here um, at SWOG and in other research bases as well. These are key ways to go, and we're really excited um, that this work is uh, happening. So I'm now going to turn it to Marie. Next slide, please, who will talk about two in-core studies that are exemplars of what I was just mentioning. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thanks to Krista and Jamie for having me join the planning group in this meeting. Greetings from Rochester, New York, where I am a nurse practitioner and an associate professor at the School of Nursing and in our URCC research space. Next slide, please. Sometimes it's good to be later in the agenda because people have already said a lot of things. For those of you who are not familiar with your, our URCC research base, we have collaborative agreements and enrollment from all of the NCOR sites pictured on this slide as of 2020, I believe. Next slide. On behalf of our whole research base, the staff, the faculty and leadership, we wanna thank those APPs who are already participating in our trials and continue to encourage participation. And I really think most of these things have been touched on by um, prior speakers, both the role that you have with patients in the delivery of patient care, but also the really important role you have with members of the research base and helping make our studies be feasible, be relevant, and be doable. URCC, um, the NCOR research base, has a specific focus on supportive care intervention, clinical trials, and cancer care delivery. And thus, we really see the engagement of all of the APPs as critical. Next slide. Thanks to Kate for already talking about our drug shortage study. I'm going to be discussing two other protocols with you that sort of show you a very specific role for the APPs in these clinical trials, where they are actually the quote unquote interventionists who will be delivering the um, study intervention to the patients. And both of them are examining care delivery models. Next slide. I'm gonna start by talking to you about a protocol that's currently active that we affectionately call GEMS, that looks at the research question, 
Does an APP care model and formal survivorship education program for survivors improve outcomes for older adult survivors with cancer compared to usual care? Next slide. I'm sure many of you know this, but today the majority of our cancer survivors are adults who are over the age of 65. And that group of individuals who are older survivors is only projected to increase in the future. Aging related conditions such as comorbidities and functional impairment are more common and prevalent in older individuals who are cancer survivors than in those who are not. And next slide. Therefore, our older cancer survivors have unique um, needs that need to be addressed in their survivorship care plans. Curative intent chemotherapy is known to cause a higher prevalence of symptomatic toxicities in older adults as compared to younger patients. And these symptomatic toxicities affect function and they persist at follow-up visits. They have complex needs also related to cognitive impairment changes that may occur during the chemotherapy and persist into the survivorship stage. Next slide. Therefore, we are attempting to examine the efficacy of comparing a GEM survivorship intervention to usual care for improving all of the outcomes listed on the slide for patients, but also looking at the communication and coordination that is occurring between the oncology APP and the primary care physician, and looking at caregiver outcomes, such as satisfaction with care and distress. And of course, our hypothesis is that our specific intervention will be better than the usual care models we have. Next slide. This is a schema, which I think most of you are used to seeing. We randomize at the site level with some sites randomized to the usual care arm and others in randomized to our intervention arm. The first part of that is to train the APPs and specific age-related um, sensitive information to share during the survivorship visit. And then the patients randomized to that arm also attend a health education program. We ask that when the patients come for their visits, they're actually seen and evaluated by the APP who's able to deliver that specialized care. Next slide. Some of uh, this patient, this study is currently enrolling sites and some of the potential benefits for APPs of course, it may improve patient outcomes because it's gonna answer the question of which is the better care model to provide survivorship oncology care for older populations. For those who are participating in the intervention arm, they receive a training program from multidisciplinary, internationally recognized experts in geriatric oncology. We have obtained certification for continuing education credit, both through medical or nursing. There's the opportunity to apply an evidence-based model of care with possible benefit to patients and caregivers. We've integrated these intervention and, and, and aging-related assessment to streamline the approach of your encounter when you see the patient in clinic. And the information that is learned, hopefully we will be able to be transferred to other patients, whether or not they're participating in this clinical trial. Next slide, please. So the question is, what the question of this study, which is um, our URC number doesn't show on top, but this is our ENABLE study. And I understand Dr. Bakaitis is in the room. So I hope I uh, correctly described the ENABLE intervention for all of you. So the question in this study is, what strategy is, is better at supporting all of the staff to implement a guideline recommended established early palliative care intervention. Next slide. So at the top of this, it says that we already know that early palliative care has resulted in improved outcomes and multiple from multiple studies. And it's recommended by ASCO guidelines that early palliative care be initiated in conjunction with treatment for those with advanced cancer. We know for the patient that there's improvements in quality of life, decreases in symptom burden, 
you can all read faster than I can talk, but there's also benefits to the caregivers that are taking care of these individuals and benefits to the healthcare system in terms of healthcare utilization and decreasing costs. But we also know the palliative care referrals are not always available. Next slide. The top of this slide um, describes the ENABLE intervention, which stands for Educate, Nurture, Advise Before Life Ends. So this is an RN delivered intervention and our protocol requires that the, uh, it be an RN to be the nurse coast delivering the intervention. But in our cohort one, uh, we have many nurse practitioners who are actually the nurse coaches for this study. It's, it in, the intervention includes a palliative care assessment and then structured nursing delivered psychoeducational telehealth sessions, which have been described in the literature slided on this slide and are guided by um, the coaching sessions that they have via the telephone are guided by a charting your course booklet. Next slide. So the question that's gonna be answered is actually an implementation science question. So is a virtual learning collaborative strategy superior to a technical assistance strategies for implementing the evidence-based enable program in NCORE practices? So we're really comparing, we know it takes a long time for our research that has proven to be efficacious to get integrated into practice. So we're trying to see if this virtual lab learning collaborative works more effectively than technical assistance. Next slide. This is the um, schema for this study. So again, in this study, sites are randomized to get either the virtual learning collaborative or the technical assistance, and we're entering groups and cohorts. Cohort one is actively enrolling, and we're looking for people to participate in cohort two. Next slide. Some of the benefits we see for APPs participating in this study include improving patient outcomes by providing evidence-based guideline compliant care, identifying the best method for implementing practice change. Again, tra the training program has been developed by internationally recognized experts in palliative care and CNEs are awarded after completion of the training program. All of the patients receive the intervention and as the nurses have been trained, they can transfer what they've learned not only to their study participants, but to the other patients that are being cared for in their practice. Next slide. Next slide. I want, I'm mindful of time. So these two studies were highlighted because of the critical role that APPs play. And um, we know that APPs are critical are critical to the delivery of this care, care delivery models and in these studies. I agree with the earlier speakers and would like to say that they not only need to be recognized, but they need to be provided the necessary resources to be actively engaged in clinical research. And I know some of the structures for how APPs are employed and what the responsibilities are can vary between academic centers and community centers. So I'm grateful that um, we've had the opportunity to hear from both. I have also included my contact information if you have further questions. Krista, I'll hand it over to you for the next speaker. Thanks so much, Marie and Kate, for that awesome presentation. And I have to say that we are um, participating in both the studies through Hawaii uh, Minority and Underserved NCORE that Marie presented and are using our APP's um, engagement in both of those studies. So I thought they were, they were great examples of how APPs can be involved in cancer care delivery research um, and symptom control studies. So we've been talking a lot about nurse practitioners and um, we haven't really talked a lot about uh, pharmacist perspective and I don't wanna leave out our PA counterparts either. So we do have a PA who's gonna be on our panel in a little bit, but first I am gonna 
turn this over to uh, Sufon Wong, who Dr. Wong uh, work, work, is a pharmacist at UC of California Irvine Health, and she is also the chair of the SWOG Pharmaceutical Science Committee, and she's agreed to talk to give us the pharmacy perspective today on all these recent changes. So can I have the next slide and welcome Dr. Wong. Dr. Wong, are you with us? Yes, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, first of all, thank you for invitation for me to be part of this uh, symposium. And of course, I truly appreciate uh, the mentioning of uh, contributions of pharmacists in your team. Uh, always love to hear that. Um, I would also say that this policy actually is coming a very interesting time for pharmacy practice as in the past decade uh, we have been seeking to expand our roles to deliver more contemporary contemporary pharmacy practice and also to be more engaging in interprofessional team care. So I think this is one opportunity to do so. However, what I like to do is to share with you uh, some very interesting aspect of pharmacy practice. Uh, and I like to refocus uh, my, my talk in the next uh, few minutes on actually on writing study agent orders, uh, which is aligned with this, uh, the objective of this policy. So next slide. So uh, in recent years, licensed pharmacist roles has evolved to include the ability to prescribe medications, adjust and monitor drug therapy, perform patient assessment, and more. So interestingly, but this is not uniform across all the states in the US. Um, currently, we have seven states that actually provide uh, pharmacists with what they call an expanded prescribing uh, authority. And then the rest of them, they just have limited prescribing authority. And the interesting thing is even among all the state and the seven state, uh, the authority varies. So I just wanted to um, take you through some of these highlights that for you to appreciate and for us and your help to help us to look at how we can uh, fully optimize this uh, APPS policy from CTAP also. So first of all, uh, I mentioned seven states uh, offering uh, expanded prescribing authority. So four states actually require pharmacists to apply for an advanced licensing in order to practice this expanded prescribing authority. Versus to three states, Florida, Idaho, and Oregon, uh, they do not require uh, pharmacists to uh, apply for new license or advanced licensing. Uh, so the roles and responsibility also across the board in the whole country has continued been changing in the last two years because of COVID as well as many of you are fully aware. So let me start with talking about what happened as the limited prescribing in all states in the US. Next slide. So pharmacists in all state currently can prescribe and administer vaccine. And I think this is a huge effort from a, a group of pharmacists who took the lead to take a position as to the current position. I think this has been a very positive change. And then growing number of states are also allowing uh, licensed pharmacists to prescribe a small number of medications like birth control, naloxone, tobacco cessation products, preventive HIV medication, and travel medicine. But you can see that within all the state, they vary different in terms of what one can uh, prescribe or dispense also. And uh, you can see that in the bullet point that I outlined uh, in this slide. So now let's move on to talk about the expanded prescribing for that seven selected state. Next slide, please. So all of the prescribed prescribing authority uh, currently uh, has to be executed under a collaborative agreement with physicians. So with that, the pharmacists in the seven states listed below have been given more authority than the limited prescribing status to prescribe additional medication uh, like those to treat minor acute conditions. 
So you can see for the seventh state, again, I put an asterisk next to the state that actually require pharmacists to acquire additional credentialing. Uh, and basically, you can look at it as an advanced license for that. So let's first of all take a look at the one that, that where advanced licensing is required. Next slide. So the fourth state, California, my home state, as you can see, they are a little bit more prescriptive in outlining what a pharmacist can do. Uh, however, they are not limiting to just drug therapy management, unlike the other three states, such as Montana, New Mexico, and uh, North Carolina. And so, and let me just also clarify that the word protocol in all these languages uh, pertain to uh, disease management protocols and not um, study protocols for that. So as you can see the wording in all this prescribing authority descriptive, uh, you can tell that they're not really addressing for uh, patients that's under uh, a clinical trial uh, care also. So now let's look at the other three states that doesn't require advanced licensing. Next slide, please. So Florida, Idaho, and Oregon, uh, they are very prescriptive. They specify what are the indication that the medication are used for that the pharmacist can prescribe, uh, as well as the management of some of these uh, diseases in terms of written protocols. And Idaho is the same thing. They're very specific in, in telling uh, people what they can do and what they cannot do. And then Oregon is uh, using, relying on the state formulary uh, to prescribe of that. But one thing, as you notice, is uh, cancer management is not, uh, quote unquote, included, unless you wanted to say uh, Florida of any other chronic condition as oncology or cancer. But I would tell you that that's not probably what they have in mind also. So next slide. So I think in conclusion, one need, for me as a pharmacist, I need to think about how does the implementation of this uh, CTAP policy impact on our practice and what we need to think about to position us uh, better in order to uh, optimize the, uh, our in engagement in this policy also. So first of all, uh, based on the information that I share with you, you can see that uh, a lot of those description really relied on interpretation of the criteria. And in addition to that, even among the four or the seven states with the expanded uh, uh, prescribing authority, compared to the limited prescribing authority, they varies so much uh, among each state. Now, when we're looking at our SWOG operation, we are constantly looking at a consistency among all states, which can make this quite challenging in that sense. And although many pharmacists are already involved in setting up um, IO orders, uh, working with teams uh, to set it up in the EMR, uh, but approving or uh, signing for the order varies, and a lot is really depending on the collaborative physicians. Um, I am aware that many of us have been doing it for years uh, under the collaborative agreement, but many others are also limited because that uh, most pharmacists are employed. They are not independent practitioner. So therefore, it really is driven by the um, department policy as well as the institutional policy also. However, I do see this policy providing an opportunity for us to truly enhance uh, interprofessional care and involving pharmacy more into direct patient care, which is something that uh, uh, we, we wanted uh, more pharmacists in. But however, um, one of the things that we need to be mindful of is because we're not recognized as independent practitioner. So this additional role really require uh, uh, approval and support by the superior as well as by the organization. And that's something that um, we need to uh, also think about as well. Lastly, 
I think as more people are involved in the process, I do think that we need to think about uh, education to ensure consistency. I think this is particularly important for uh, managing uh, clinical trials because it's an essential element for clinical trial uh, conduction also. So I, I hope I share with you some of the um, uh, potential limitation uh, for pharmacists to be fully engaged and fully uh, 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 employ this policy. Uh, however, I think more and more interprofessional care help. I mean, uh, I hear some of those glowing review of the value of the pharmacists on the team and, and I'm very pleased and happy to hear that because that has been honestly my own personal experience also. Uh, I, I've always feel very blessed for that. So I truly hope that this policy is going to uh, actually uh, support uh, more pharmacists engaging in more uh, interprofessional uh, team care. And thank you for your time. And again, thank you for the organizer to uh, invite me to be part of this uh, symposium. Thanks so much, Dr. Wong. That was great insight from the pharmacy perspective. Um, we are gonna have a panel discussion now. I'd like to welcome back up uh, Dr. Benson, uh, Lisa, Marge, and Melissa Faust. Melissa Faust is, um, CCD coordinator extraordinaire who was recommended by NRG to represent them on this panel. Um, we're also going to have multiple um, um, panelists from the from the virtual space too. Um, I'd like to welcome Maureen Haugen, who is a nurse practitioner at the Ann and Robert H. Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago, and she's with the Children's Oncology Group. Um, I would like to welcome Alicia Detroit, who is a physician's, physician's assistant at Atrium Health, Wake Forest Baptist, and she's going to represent Wake Forest Research Base. And um, I'd like to welcome Andrea Denikoff, who is also here virtually, who, may, who can answer any questions um, about the CTEP, uh, guide, the CTEP policy changes. Um, and we're um, gonna, next slide. Just want to make sure everybody is on virtually. Um, so Andrea, do you want to say hi if you're on? Yeah, sure. I was just closing my door because I know um, um, my son's in the house. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm really happy to be here. I just think it's been a great symposium. I don't really have a whole lot to add just to say I'm just thrilled. I was a um, APP in 1995 at a um, NCI designated cancer center and was one of the first there and all the hoops and hurdles I had to jump through. So seeing, um, hearing about all that you're doing um, and seeing all the collaborations and the roles growing is just really exciting. And I'm glad I could be a part of it. Um, like I said, with, or like Marge and, and Kate had said um, with the other NCI, uh, nurses at NCI very supportive of this. So um, we're here to sort of support this growth. We think it's time and it's exciting to see. Th thanks, Andrea. Maureen, do you wanna just verify that you're on and say hi real quick? Yeah, <laughs> hi, I'm here. I was just trying to fix my video. So hi everyone, I'm Maureen Haugen. I'm a nurse practitioner and an APP manager at Lurie Children's Hospital in Chicago. Thank you. And then Alicia, I believe you were, you're on too. We can you say hi? Yes. Hi, everyone. Alicia Detroit. I'm from Atrium Health Wake Forest Baptist. I've been a PA working in oncology for 18 years, and I am also an advanced practice leader, uh, leading a workforce of approximately 1,000. Um, I'm also involved with the Association of PAs in Oncology, which is a national organization also advocating for APPs in oncology. So thanks so much for all, everybody joining and for our presenters for coming back up and for Melissa to be representing NRG. I'm gonna start um, with a question and then we'll take um, some questions from the audience, but I, how, I wanna know, how do you see APPs better integrated within your research base? I think we did hear um, from 
the Alliance and from ECOG Akron. I'd like to hear maybe Melissa, could you speak to maybe how you see this being better integrated into the energy research base? It's on. Oh, it, your microphone's on. Okay, great. Thank you. So I, I jotted down some notes because I wanted to make sure that I didn't just sit up here and ramble after hearing all the excellent, all the excellent um, prepared uh, uh, talks. So obviously my area of specialty is a cancer care delivery research. And cancer care delivery research, by its very definition, is the perfect place to incorporate APPs. Um, I so enjoyed Kate's talk and um, Marie's talk, um, particularly as they emphasize some CCDR protocols in which my NCOR is involved. But um, to reemphasize some of the things that they said, advanced practice nurses, they're the perfect choice to lead CCDR research. Um, they're trained in implementation science. They're used to incorporating evidence-based practice into their work, and that's what we need. Um, additionally, they'll be able to lead the research efforts for, and their contributions to research will be formally acknowledged um, by both being able to lead and also by um, authorship, which I think is very important. And I also wanted to just mention that um, at NRG, Dr. Bruner is the multi-PI of the NRG NCOR, and she is a nurse. And I had reached out to her when Krista asked me to be on this panel, and she was so enthusiastic. I wish she could be here to um, offer her view. So I've tried to do that for her. <laughs> Thanks, thanks, Melissa. Um, I'm going to ask um, Alicia if you could um, speak. I don't feel we've heard the PA's voice yet, so I'd really like to see how you see um, APPs being inter better integrate within Wake Forest. And then I'd like to hear from um, we'd like to hear from Maureen as well after you. Great. Um, well, I would love to just briefly speak to um, PA education because I'm not sure that we've heard that voice as well. So um, PAs are masters trained, uh, but we certainly have a trend of many of them going back and getting doctoral degrees. Um, in our masters training, uh, we do have uh, research components. Uh, many of us, um, many of the programs culminate with a capstone project, so they already have uh, much of the evidence-based uh, skills that are required um, for learning how to conduct research and um, implement that into uh, papers. Um, we are trained in a medical um, model and um, are really generalist trained. Um, much like our APRN colleagues, I believe that we are a little unique in that we look at the patients very holistically. And I think that is a unique benefit uh, for APPs being integrated into research uh, because we are able to kind of look at the whole picture. Um, that is especially important at Wake Forest where we are doing many uh, supportive care studies and um, complementary uh, studies as well as uh, treatment-based. Um, so I would say those are my thoughts. Thanks so much. And, and Maureen? Hi, everyone. Maureen Hogan. Um, the experience that we've had at Lurie Children's is similar to what some of you have already addressed, specifically you, Krista, um, in identifying APP champions of studies. And about five years ago, we did that with our cancer control studies within Children's Oncology Group, um, that we identified APP experts um, that were more familiar with certain studies. And um, then they were in charge of identifying patients and actually consenting patients for study then. Um, I also lobbied with our site PR, COGPI, um, to obtain, um, get funding for the APPs um, uh, as we're getting a case re per case reimbursement for these patients. And that uh, every patient that we um, put on study that we would get some money back that would be put into a fund that they could use for education or um, travel to um, the cooperative uh, group meetings. Um, so that was an incentive and also um, gave um, uh, the APP some authority and uh, ownership over um, their patients and trying to get patients on study as well. Um, 
one of the, can I talk a little bit about barriers that we found? Or do you want sure, to please go ahead? Yep. Um, one of the barriers that we found obviously would be the 24, lack of 24 seven availability. If you have an APP champion who um, only works Monday through Friday during the day. And so um, we also um, uh, tried to engage uh, the multidisciplinary team to um, help with at least identification um, so that we could capture patients over the weekend as well. Um, as well as during the research meetings, we would talk about each study and um, opportunities missed and, and then everybody uh, talk together about how we could overcome some of these barriers and uh, so that it wouldn't happen again. Um, I think many of us will agree that APPs tend to be almost 100% clinical, if not all clinical. And so to have protected time to do this has, has been the most difficult um, issue that we're running between patients or running between clinics and meeting to go and um, meet with families and consent with them. I haven't actually figured that, up, that part out yet, um, but uh, most of the other issues I've been able to, um, to work with. So thank you again for inviting me to be, participate in this, Crystal. Thanks so much. I think Lisa, did you want to comment? Yeah, actually, I, I would completely agree with 100% clinical time. I think building on the backbone of that too, access to funding is really hard for us. Um, many grants require MD uh, or PhD. And um, even with that, I think we, even where there is funding that's available for folks that aren't MD, PhD prepared, I think sometimes we don't get taken quite as seriously, and I hate to say that in such a derogatory manner, but um, I think definite lack of funding is a problem. I think that's a great point. I really, I mean, I do, I do think we do face barriers that people aren't aware of. Um, if we don't have PhDs, if we don't have MDs, that type of thing. And, and it's interesting that I noticed that you, you know, that trial that you wrote, all of those, you know, years ago, and was, was actually able to do that. Do you think that you would be able to do that today or that wouldn't be possible? Um, I think it would still be possible. I think getting treatment trials through NCI as a whole is mm -hmm. difficult at best um, with all the steering committees and stuff now, but I think it would still be, be possible. I have the lucky, fortunate to have a great mentor in that who was the, you know, NCI responsible for that trial, but mm -hmm. he really did mentor me and really let me put my touch on that and, and write and present and publish it. So that was a physician champion that mm -hmm. you worked at. So I just want to highlight the, our, we appreci really appreciate our okay. physician champions. And um, Dr. Benson, maybe you can speak to how do you see specific roles for APPs um, that might differ from other investigators or how we can add um, to physician investigators within the research bases? Yeah, I, I wouldn't really view them as much different uh, <laughs> with uh, the training and so forth. And um, I also think it's important, you know, one of the reasons for the uh, uh, ACCC clinical trials initiative, as well as the ASCO ACCC collaborative efforts that are going on now, is despite tremendous efforts through the years, we have not budged clinical trial participation. Mm -hmm. And I think one hope is that if we really engage the entire team, uh, specifically APPs, uh, maybe this is a, a better solution to increasing accrual. And also, um, you know, physicians readily think of the therapeutic trials. They're not so good about the cancer control trials. They just don't come to mind. And uh, uh, in, in some work uh, that when we kind of looked at this issue, if you don't have a coordinator uh, readily available, those trials just are not considered. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a, a huge area 
where uh, APPs can play a great uh, role. I think it's consistent with training, uh, an area of great interest, and they can really be uh, champions. And with that type of work, um, I think they're well poised to develop trials um, that can be conducted at our uh, institutions. I'll, I'll also add that uh, what, when you get to the commitment and the culture, the uh, RVU system, of course, has ha come under great fire, especially recently, and many of us view it as a total failure uh, and certainly not in the interest of patients. And uh, so uh, at both the physician and APP level, part of this commitment is we have to give people sufficient time to do this work, not only uh, in terms of helping to develop the research strategies, but we all know that when you enter a patient on a clinical trial, it's much more work. It's more work when you have your actual physician encounter, but then all the work that goes on afterwards is, is quite considerable. And if we're really committed to this strategy that this represents a standard of care, it must be reckon, uh, recognized. And this is at the institutional level where we need to make it clear, this is comprehensive cancer care. And we have to have the time to be able to offer this to our patients. And if we really are committed to increasing patient accrual, whether it's in the area of therapeutics or cancer control, cancer care delivery, these other uh, important types of research, there has to be a change. And I view bringing uh, APPs completely integrated into this process is uh, a hope that we can get closer to uh, achieving these goals. Thank you. Thank you very much for your support and that great answer. Um, I guess I'm gonna ask, I had another question up here, what barriers do we anticipate going forward with APP integration? But I'm gonna change that a little bit and ask um, how do APPs and uh, physicians uh, who are on um, this panel think that you can get other APPs in the clinical space to get engaged? Because I think in a sense, we're, we're, we're preaching to the choir here on one hand, but then I know we ha I have a lot of colleagues that you know say, I don't have time for that. I don't, you know, I'm, I, I'm not interested in research. I don't know about research, you know, th those things. So how do we think, um, Lisa, can I start with you? Sure. Um, I think on a very fundamental level, um, as Dr. Benson alluded to, is changing how we look at clinical trial patients in the clinic. Um, right now, whether my patient's getting standard of care treatment or clinical trial treatment, their appointment time is the exact same and smashed right in between a huge busy clinic. We're actually looking at seeing if we can have different visit types for clinical trial patients to allow us that extra time because I'll be one to admit too, um, as well as some of my other colleagues, it's like, okay, are we gonna put them on standard of care, clinical trial, you know, and then you're looking at all the extra work that you're gonna be doing. And um, sometimes we just, we don't have time to enroll them in a trial. And I know that sounds really yeah. self-centered and selfish, but I, it just comes to that some days when we're all of us, physicians, APPs, nurses, everybody is overworked. Um, I think we need to do a better job in the clinical space to really recognize that clinical trial patients probably get better care in the long run um, with all their um, extra visits and things we're checking on, but it's, it's really difficult to care from them in the same time space as you would somebody who's getting standard of care. Thank, thanks for those comments, Lisa. I'm going to jump over to the chat. Um, sorry, I'm trying to read and use the microphone. Okay. Um, okay. So um, there's a comment from Karen Chung and she says, I very much uh, appreciate the content of this forum and the efforts presented here to better integrate APPs into clinical research at the institutional and cooperative group level. What suggestion do the panelists have to achieve the same goals 
at the industry letter, industry level, considering the heterogeneity with which APPs understand and or engage with pharma companies. Um, I'm going to maybe ask maybe Lisa again to speak to that a little bit. And then I'll and then I'll ask Maureen. I, I'm not sure, and then maybe Alicia, but I know Wake Forest is more of an Encore specific research base, so not sure she's prepared to answer that question. <laughs> Can you repeat just the end of that question? Sure. So the end of this question is: What do the panelists? What? How would we achieve the same goals at the industry level? level? Because I'm I'm thinking that. Karen is saying that, well, we're doing this within the cooperative group level, but how do we get this, you know, to our industry partners? So I think you have a good example of what you guys do at Mayo. You've shared with me, correct? I, I think so. Okay. <laughs> I think, see if I can come back with it. I think one thing to get APPs involved with more research is um, meeting with your medical science liaison. Um, one way you know you can you can do that to meet with them to see what might be in the pipeline um, coming from from industry as well as um, they can also turn you on to potential funding opportunities that may be available through industry. Um, I'm just trying to think what else. What did I share with you? You're, wait, you're wait, I'm drawing wait. a blank. Uh, no, I remember one time you sharing with me that you actually, within the how you guys do the contracts within the industry, that you know APPs are actually a lot to sign for the orders, you know, on your industry trials and oh. things like that, that maybe would integrate APPs better into industry sponsored okay. research. I'm yep. not sure if that's what the so within Mayo, we have been able to sign um, consent and enrollment and do study drug for industry trials for many years now. And I think that has helped with our APPs to get involved in learning clinical trials and whatnot, because we have a fair amount, probably about 50-50 of investigator initiated versus industry trials. I think we all know that over the last 10 years, industry trials have picked up um, in terms of what you may have access to, to some of the new drugs, they're not funding as many investigator initiated trials anymore. So I think it's really good that, like I said, to meet with your medical science liaison to know what trials there are available. Um, I've met with some of our MSLs and they've told me about trials and I'm like, okay, we need to get that here. So then I'll talk to, um, our MD, uh, in our MDs in our tumor group and say, Hey, there's this great study coming from XYZ company. I think this is something we could accrue really well to, and would be of benefit to our patients. Otherwise we're not going to potentially have access to this drug. Thanks. Dr. Yeah, Johnson, may I just say, it starts really at the very basic level. So what we do and have done for years um, our APPs are immediately put on the investigator log that's submitted. And when we have our site initiation visits, the APPs are present. Uh, we also, uh, we have a weekly research meeting and the APPs are uh, directly involved with this, but we also set aside a time every week for an hour where, for example, uh, industry can present a pipeline and so forth, and the APPs are all involved with that. So uh, that's what I mean by total integration. But it starts right at the very beginning. You put the name on the investigator yeah. log. It makes a lot of sense. So hopefully that's some you know, good information for our virtual attendees as well as our in-person attendees. I want to... Um, call out another uh, Dr. Lesser, who is the PI from Encore um, Wake Forest Research Base. He wants to know, um, he wants to hear from the panelists on what motivates NPPs to be involved in research. I think that's a great question. What does, so I'm going to ask uh, to our virtual um, panelists, um, Maureen, can you start with that? Um, I think, first of all, you have to have a good team. Um, I'm lucky to be you. part of, can you hear me? You might yeah. be frozen. Oh, wait, I think you're coming. Can you hear me? No? Yeah. No, yeah. I can't hear you. Um, I'm going to move to Alicia. Uh, maybe okay. Alicia, do you want to speak? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, and I have, do have to shout out Dr. Lesser as my collaborative physician for 18 years. So um, when we think about sponsorship, he has certainly opened doors uh, that might not 
otherwise be open to me. Uh, but for the question, I would just say um, that APPs working um, from an academic medical center perspective, um, you know, you get in a point in your career where you are doing amazing things in the clinical setting and you feel that you may not have the same opportunities to do other professional advancement. And so I think it starts with just really having that conversation and um, understanding what the APP's goals are. Um, I think oftentimes um, that we just assume that APPs just want to practice clinically, uh, but many of them have other goals. And so I would encourage that conversation um, and you know, opening once you hear of what they are interested in, trying to find the right opportunities for them to pursue. Thank you very much. And I'm going to allow Maureen, did you want to? Yes, can, uh, hopefully yes, you can we hear can me hear now. you now. Yeah. Okay. Um, I am lucky in that I am a half-time provider on the HEMA malignancy team, but I'm also the APP manager for uh, 23 APPs in the ambulatory area in HEMONC. Um, and so I feel lucky in the sense that I know exactly what everybody's doing. I know how they work. And um, I'm also part of the oncology research meeting that we have, but I also participate in um, mid-year reviews and end-of-the-year reviews. So I suggest, um, I, uh, you know, uh, clinical trials, especially if there's new cancer control um, trials coming out, that they, I help them lobby to be the site champion for those um, clinical trials coming out. So I think it's, it's just trying to be creative to, um, and empower the APPs that they can do it and help them to be able to do it. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I think there's a lot of um, mentorship and um, even providing opportunities for education as we are going to have a workshop in the fall that's APP specific. Did Lisa, did you want to add, add to that at all about just how to engage APPs in clinical research? Sure. So I've been very lucky that at my institution about a year ago, a position was actually created within the department of an APP research lead, which I currently hold. And I've been given time. And really my sole focus is to get our, especially our new APPs. We've had a huge turnover plus additions of APPs in the last three years, but to work as a mentor and to help them um, understand different things in research and learn about research within oncology, because a lot of them were brand new APPs, so they never heard of a cooperative group or you know, didn't know how to take care of somebody on a clinical trial. Um, but also being able to provide that mentorship and connect them with other mentors for ideas that they may have. Um, there's a lot of APPs in our group who have wonderful ideas for symptom management trials, et cetera. And being able to help them kind of foster that and learn from the ground up how to get themselves out there and be able to do that. So um, I would encourage if places have, you know, a large group of APPs that you kind of band together and, you know, potentially maybe name somebody who can help, who has the experience and can, can be a mentor to new APPs in that arena. Thanks so much, Lisa. Are there any questions um, from the audience here? or any questions specifically uh, regarding the NCI policy and guideline changes? I do have a few more in the chat, but wanted to give the um, audience an opportunity to before we close. Yeah, hi, I'm Jeff Berenberg from Hawaii. I think I know you. Oh, I know, I think <laughs> I know you too, yeah. <laughs> so my, my general question is, um, is there a need, uh, I think there's a need for you know specific research training um, and what can be done maybe through the, either through the NCI or through the cooperative group research bases to provide that kind of training? Um, so we are gonna start, you know, our, our goal is, you know, our plan, it's not just a goal, it's a plan uh, to hold an APP specific workshop in the fall. And I don't know specifically where that will go. Um, I almost like to think of doing it annually, so off, maybe offering something like that annually, but have to look for funding for that and space for that. But that is what we're going to um, do in the fall. And that is kind of that, you know, research 101 that, you know, the nuts and bolts of, of, of research. So 
And the other thing that that does is, is it allows individuals uh, that are like-minded to begin to share ideas and um, and help them to see, oh, you know, if someone is doing this at Mayo, I can bring that, that back to Wake Forest. So I think those types of workshops, uh, while providing content, uh, the networking is even more effective. Thanks a lot, Alicia. And I do want to give a shout out to um, App Show, who is holding a workshop um, coming up in a couple months about the role of the advanced practice provider in clinical research. So hopefully just offering more educational opportunities like this out there as well. Someone else is at the mic, just so everybody knows on Zoom. Yeah. Hi, thank you. I'm Stephanie Engling with uh, Wincourt Marshall Clinic. I'm speaking on behalf of our administrator who is... Um, slightly disabled at this point. <laughs> uh, so his question uh, was, uh, you had talked about having a dedicated research lead. What does dedicated time look like for an APP being integrated into research? Great question. That's one of our main barriers and it alludes to somebody else's comment on uh, Mer Mary Lou Affronti on the chat is asking about how do we break down these barriers to have get time? So I was given 10% time, which is not nearly enough, but um, it was a good place to start. So I get, I'm not full-time clinical already. I had other things that I have my hands into for committees and stuff at Mayo that I get time protected. But for the specific research lead, I was given 10% time, which means I get a half a day out of clinic every week. Um, again, like I said, it's not, it's not enough time, um, but it's something to start with. And I think you know, as I develop this program more, I'm, I'm building this from the ground up. I don't know what all can be done. Um, I have a lot of ideas, but I think at that point, then I go back to my department and potentially ask for more time. I got to show some benefit first of what I've been able to do and the value added that this position has had. But I think it's a good place to start um, in terms of time protected. I hope that's helpful. We're, we are unfortunately going to need to close um, because we are running into our plenary. So I just want to have Jamie come up for a few um, closing comments. I really thank everybody on the panel and the virtual attendees, and I hope everybody um, felt this was very useful. And thank you guys so much. We really are grateful for everybody who attended today. And um, thank you so much to our panelists and our speakers who've given us such excellent examples for best practices to take back to our own communities. So there was one more question in the chat that I will just address briefly. That workshop that Krista mentioned will be focused specifically for advanced practice providers. And we are planning to hold it in conjunction with the fall meeting. And some of the content would include ways to identify and reduce barriers. Um, the uh, information about uh, rostering for non-physician investigators. That can be a little bit of a challenging process. We'll spend some time on that. We'll spend some time on uh, how to document, assess, and um, work with adverse events. And then at, in conjunction with that workshop, we also will be taking applications for people who would have an interest to serve on the task force, which will then look uh, going forward within SWOG and hopefully within the other research bases as well about ways we can uh, reduce barriers, we can enhance recognition. Um, and if any of you are, have an interest in either one of those things, you can contact Krista or I, which is on the slide, which is not on the screen right now. Um, if we could pop that last slide up, maybe we'll have that for uh, everyone as you exit. And Krista, do you wanna say something else? No, just thanks to everybody. I really appreciate all the expertise today and hopefully we can get that slide up before we close. There it is. And just in case you guys have any questions. Oh, and this is going to be recorded and you will be able to access it on the SWAG website if you missed it or want to access any of these slides or the presentation. So thanks so much, everyone. I really appreciate everybody. Thanks. And to Jamie, too, for being an awesome partner in organizing. Great job, you guys. about your agency. You know, just being at a small community site, thinking about